what we've realised is that the room layouts, we, we, we might end up doing a lot of this, or we might just apologise if we end up just staring at each other and not. But as long as you can hear us, and I've got if some post it notes. Do some like some signs. You'll probably hear Sarah as she talks in my direction, and you'll probably hear me, yeah. maybe, or something. And we've got some post it notes that explain our questions. We're very well prepared. <laughs> me and Sarah have known each other for years. I think it's a decade. It's heading that way, isn't yeah. it? It's quite scary. Really, mm. so. Yeah. so, yeah, whereas she's done lots of these interviews because of her amazing new book, and I haven't. Um, and a lot of them will be quite formal, whereas I feel like Az is just going to descend into hell in a sort of chatty <laughs> kind of way. Sorry. No, it's going to be good. So, Sarah. Hello. It's Jamie. How are you? Oh, all right, man. How are it's you? Lovely to see you. <laughs> Very well. Why don't you tell everybody uh, your journey into craft? That's a good one. I'm going to drink this wine. <laughs> you're not allowed anymore because you're driving me I'm to driving. the station. <laughs> um, my journey into craft was n- didn't really learn it at school at all. My grandmother used to knit and cross stitch re- so well that it was painful when she tried to teach me and say let me look at the back and (laughs) it put me off craft really and I only got into craft in 2008 when I literally was on a train journey to Glasgow when I worked for Difford which is not a Welsh town it's the Department for International Development and to travel across the country doing my job and I couldn't read so many books and reports and do my emails on the trains because most of them were pendolinos and I'd get a bit travel sick and I'm sure you'll all agree in the room that if you like being creative and so much of your work is online and reports and writing and tapping and things, my hands were literally craving to make something, to do something, but I love to paint. Um, and obviously I couldn't do that on trains because my preferred painting was watercolors, which doesn't really work on <laughs> trains. So I picked up a little cross stitch kit of a teddy bear which was this big, um, and I just found it in a shop and just thought, oh, I could do that on a train. It's small, I'll put it in my bag. When I want to be creative, maybe I'll try this out. I'll look at YouTube to see how to do it. So that was my first proper self-initiated introduction to craft, never with the idea of linking it with activism at all. It was just my hands were craving to make something, and I made it on this train, and noticed that it calmed me down and it slowed me down and we talk a lot about the slow movement with craft and I slowly thought hang on a minute this is really helping with my mental health with anxiety the fact that it's that repetitive action is helping me think more clearly about my activism work and it was giving me the comfort of craft to finally ask myself quite uncomfortable questions that I just was avoiding like was I being an effective activist in my personal life? Was I being an effective activist trainer, which is what my job was as a professional? And this, yeah, the process of craft just helped me massively think through these quite hard questions that no other creativity or other tool had offered. And then it sort of delved into lots more areas. Did when you got off the train? Did you carry on like that evening? Was it like quite an instant? Well, no, I got off the train and had to go and deliver a workshop to 50 teenagers on being being activists. So I couldn't, but it was mulling in my head of, I think there's something in this that I want to explore more. But also I was very um, challenging on myself to say, because activism is my whole life and was and I thought I don't want to just shoehorn craft into activism unless I think there's a natural connection there so, so were you like instantly thinking that like you, you, I was you're instantly doing a craft thinking, you... I was thinking this has given me an opportunity to think about stuff in a very clear way where if you're not if you're thinking about depressing issues like you watch the news and you're not using your hands we all know you can go in a downward spiral can't you because you just like there's so much awful stuff and this was the first time that I could engage with awful stuff but feel empowered at the same time so it there was definitely click moments that I wanted to explore more but it wasn't a fully formed thought of this fits perfectly it was Ooh, this is I've got a niggling feeling that this might be useful and I want to explore a bit more. Where's that teddy bear now? 
You are. Where's the teddy bear? It was so ugly, and I had no one that wanted it. Day. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I just put it in the bin. Did you? So then, no. how how long was it? No, in terms of like, did you just do cross stitching for fun for a while, and then? Something happened, or no? I've never done craft for fun. Never. <laughs> no, I've only for pain. No, I've done it for presents for people. So I used to do paintings for people, and then I started making craft presents for them. But it was more about learning the technique. But always, I'm I'm have got a strange brain. I'm always thinking my motivation is I want to make the world a better place, not as a hero complex, just. You know, it motivates me and it's a nice thing to it's do. In your genes, isn't it? It's in my genes, parents being activists and all. And then seeing, okay, well, the slowness helps, so the process of craft might help me think, might help other people think. And then on another train journey, I had people asking me what I was making. And I thought, I wish I was stitching something around social change so I could discuss <laughs> social change with them. It's so it was, it was totally like, it was very like it was it was always about problem solving and about things happening you know responses to people and then going imagine if i was quoting if i was stitching a quote by gandhi i could talk about that and not just i'm stitching this gift for my brother which was i did a, a frankenstein on a pillowcase for him and then i did a big um fabric paint speech <laughs> bubble saying don't go to sleep, I'll kill you. <laughs> and gave that to him for Christmas. So I was like, oh, I really wish it was something else. So it all sort of happened quite organically, which is interesting. What about you, James? Yes, well done. Good segue. <laughs> yes. Um, so I don't think I know your James you Intercraft. Have we not had that conversation? No? Maybe 10 years ago. Maybe 10 old. years. It's been a long time. Yeah. So I've been cross-stitching for about 15 years. And the story goes... I was going on holiday to Canada and I wanted something to do on a flight, quite a long flight, and I went into a haberdashery shop and I saw a cross-stitch kit on the wall and I just thought it'd be funny. I was like, imagine what people will think on a plane if they see a man of my size doing some cross-stitch. Like, mm -hmm. that'll freak them out. I also think being bald and cross-stitching oh. <laughs> is also, like, even more shocking. Wow. Yeah. Just saying wow. that on camera. Where's... <laughs> Unfortunately, I was. Yeah, unfortunately, so. But wow, I never put that. Is it because my head looks like a thimble? <laughs> yeah, but just because you just look like this big burly man, and then you're cross stitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, but I think that was it. That was the the thing. I thought there's a real contrast there, or whatever. So I didn't do it on the plane on the way over because I bought this kit and I looked at it and I was like, Christ, that's quite. There's a lot to deal with there. But when I got to Canada, kind of got it out. Had to go, and that thing is so. How many of you do cross stitch? How many of you have done that? A little bit, and then presumably you've all made stuff though with your hands. And that when you're in that creative space, like cross stitch is quite special because you can only do it so fast, mm -hmm. and there's a repetition to it, and so it really does unlock a thing in your soul. And I've taught cross stitch to a lot of people, and I really enjoy that. Whether it's a bunch of eight year olds or a bunch of eighty year olds or whatever. You see people smiling because it soothes them on this fundamental level that you can't explain until you try it. But it's good stuff. And so that was what got me. It was that thing of just being like, oh, I really like this. And then I'm making a thing. And it just kind of all went from there. Like I, It took me about two years to finish the first thing. Mm -hmm. And I misread the codes. So Art Nouveau head is framed in my mum's house now. But her hair's wrong in one place and her face is wrong in another place because I just got the colours mixed up. And then after that, I found a geisha girl, and I did that, and that was okay. And then I started doing the Kiss by Klimt, which is 70,000 stitches, and that just... I, there's a thing where if you miscount cross-stitch, and then it doesn't fit together. And after a while, like, sometimes you have to unpick things. But yeah. with the Kiss by Klimt, there's so many... Uh, in the end, there's a project called The Unfinishables, where people submitted work that they couldn't finish, whether it was for someone who passed on or for whatever reason. And I gave them that because I was like, I seriously can't finish this. I sort of said, it's because, you know, now I'm Mr. X Stitch and it's not really what I'm about anymore. But the answer was, I just couldn't handle that. You must, if you, yeah, unfinished objects, UFOs. Yes, I do have lots of UFOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ones that I will never Instagram, but you're just like, ooh, that's a disaster. But I'll learn from that mistake. I think every, every stitcher has got a box of regret somewhere in their house, isn't yeah. it? Ideally with cross stitch, but I mean, who's to say yeah. that lives people lead? Uh, so, 
But then I found a piece of software called PC Stitch, which uh, meant you could design your own patterns. And that was really freeing because it meant I could find things I liked, import pictures and make cross stitch patterns. And so that helped. And then I started making designs of like superheroes and cars and just working some stuff out, doing a bit of graffiti and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm like a frustrated graffiti artist where I don't have the skills, but I find other people's work, turn it into cross stitch, pretend it was an homage and get away with it. Mm-hmm. And was it always cross stitch or did you venture out and then always come back to cross stitch? I tried, I did try venturing out. I did a little bit of hand embroidery a couple of times, but the freedom of it all was a bit terrifying. Yeah. It's too much choice. Mm-hmm. And yet the pixels, there's a sort of safety there. Yeah. That I quite enjoy. Like, I'd like to do more embroidery embroidery in the end. Like, I'd like to I do Japanese. I've forced you into Japan- doing a few, Yeah, I? you have. Yeah. <laughs> I still love you. Um, I'd like to do Japanese embroidery, because that's, like, the stuff that they do on kimonos, and it's really fine. And I think that sometimes if you do work that people don't like, they will criticise the technique mm-hmm. as a way of circumventing the fact they don't like the content. Mm. So they criticise the form. Whereas if you do Japanese embroidery, if you do gold work or something that's sublime that they can't criticise the technique, then they have to go, I don't like that. Yeah. You know, rather than go, mm, it's only cross stitch, which is what they normally do. It's not what you normally get. Yeah. The, the, I've done talks at like guilds and yeah. stuff, and you do, you go like, who does cross stitch? And there'll be Sharon at the back who puts her hand up, yeah. afraid, because all the like, the stump workers around her are like, don't say a word, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and, and it yeah. bugs me because it's like when you try and teach cross stitch, People don't really want to pay a lot to learn cross stitch. Yeah, I've realised that you could learn cross stitch and five years later you could pick it back up again and know how to do it immediately. Whereas if you'd learn gold work, you won't know how to do that immediately. So we can teach people a skill that they will have forever and people are like, not paying seven pounds to learn that. It's very awkward, really. But it's the whole craft art thing as well, isn't yeah. it? Low brow, high brow, low brow. You may recall that time when we did them TEDx talks in a place called Bedford. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. 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 And this person was there. Yeah. 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 I think she was probably there. She was definitely ah. there. <laughs> Everybody was there. But yeah, no, the craft versus art thing is all just bunkum is what I roughly said in that, really. Mm. It's just politics. Let's not get into politics tonight. Sarah. I think you were after me, so I just yeah. zoned out because I was like, oh, just <laughs> it. so I didn't really listen. I really liked it because we were quite late in the program and it's like which is not good the more the closer you get like when you're the first couple of people on a TEDx thing where it's like it's quite important then you're done and you can relax but we were like third from last and second from last or something yeah. and it was just like yeah this is great and at lunchtime people are like you're having a good day and you're like I'm having a great day yeah. <laughs> why is this not over yet yeah. and you had a, like a presentation where you could look and see pictures that would remind you what to say Whereas I had pictures of lovely artwork that had nothing to do with what I was saying and had to try that and remember. That was your choice, Jane. I know. <laughs> so remembering. No I've given up all. remembering since, which no is sympathy. good now. Um, so. I can't see the post-its, so no, you no, need no. to go to the no, next No, 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 we're carrying on with our craft journey. Oh, so it is, okay. ma- it is manifold and varied. You're on it. Yeah, yeah, all I'm gonna say is, so in 2008, I started an Etsy store trying to sell patterns. To this day, I've sold about 300 patterns in nearly a decade not my greatest achievement but I started a blog about it as well no there's a company there's a website called We Little Stitches and they do cross stitches of like people so you could have like the Big Bang Theory and they do them and all that sort of thing and I remember casually looking and they've been around for like four years and have had like 35,000 sales and I was like yeah really strengths in other areas but that was the weird thing so I started this blog and I was like right I'm going to call myself Mr X Stitch started a blog wrote some posts a bit about because the idea is if you've got brand is you like tell behind the scenes stories you add value to the brand so people understand the creation of it all and stuff and so I did a few posts about me why I like cucumber sandwiches the most efficient way to put clothes on an air which is obviously putting the socks in pairs at the time because it's quick to get them off and then over time realised it would be more interesting for people to do about contemporary embroidery and needlework Good decision there. I think people will be... I could have written more about Tell us more about (laughs) you. I feel like... I even had a game. I even even thought that there was a possibility you could have a competitive, like, Japanese TV show where people would put clothes on air as, like, blindfold. I had commentators in my head who would create my performance. Focus. I was so very alone in those times. I was very alone. Um... Yeah, no, and I started focusing on other people. And things in 2008, there weren't very many websites that were focusing on contemporary embroidery and needlework often because I took it seriously but not too seriously. 
and we did things like stitch gasms and not safe for work Saturdays where we showed rude things it kind of took off a bit mm. and then I managed to convince other people to write columns about the things they liked and 10 years later here we are mm. that's largely it I've glossed over the 10 years but the beginning bit was fun <laughs> but then in 2009 I'm going to say I heard about this girl called Sarah who's doing this craftivist stuff yeah. and she was doing a campaign about trains and I posted oh, nice. a, a picture yeah. of her yeah, and I, I don't think we'd met by then. No, we haven't. And then we met and you thought Tamsin Omond was me. I thought there was this really cool blonde girl. There was, was a like, very cool, That's got to be Sarah Corby because she was well And cool. I was the shorter, <laughs> not so cool Big person. woolen hat over your eyes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we met then, but we don't remember that. Yeah. We were discussing this in the car. We were trying to work out when we met and realised we really don't remember. I remember following remember. your stuff a lot. And because I started my... Lonely Craftivist blog, which is so emo to say out loud. That was great. In 2008, but the collective in 2009. And because there wasn't many people doing craft that wasn't, you know, your grannies, really. It was like suddenly you found each other very quickly. Mm. So I remember following your stuff and then a few pieces being shared on your site. And then... My, then my excuse was I was doing this project with Save the Children, I'm a Peace project, which was for the when the G20 was hosted in the UK by David Cameron. And it was amazing. Save the Children basically said, what can you do leading up to the G20 where we can engage the craft audience? So And they gave me a blank sheet of paper, which is incredible of them. And I basically said, this is what I think we can do with, I think we had six months from launch we had five months because I had a month before that to set it all up and um, and they said we can take people to go see our projects overseas so I basically put this man in my pitch saying I'll bring some craft stars um, to Indonesia <laughs> which they didn't was, know any, any which they had no idea <laughs> but you had a big following Jamie so I took um, Lauren who is Deadly Knit Shade who did the Knit London stuff and lots of yarn bombing. Still Hillary does. that does craft blog, which is still I think the most popular craft blog in the UK, and Jamie. And it was great because we had such a mix of contemporary, traditional, knit, cross stitch, hand embroidery, and we all went to Indonesia. Mm. And before then we met up for me to I remember phoning you all saying, Will you do this thing? Um and it was a big commitment because I said I want you to all do at least one event. I want you to be mm. at the launch yeah. at the beginning, which was for World Food Day in October. And then at the end, which was February, March the following year in Manchester. And they could have all said, I'm busy, too much to do. I'll go on the free trip, but nothing else. But it was like, it was a real family of... Bonkers, we called ourselves the Crafty Avengers. We still do. <laughs> yeah, we that's still lovely. do. And it was a, for me again. That was one of those moments where you think there's more to craft than what some people think. And we all had very different ways of doing craft. Different benefits we got out of it. We all were very different. We all lived in different places. Hillary had a family. Like we were all very different, but also had this common common thread. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, yeah. I mean, sitting on a plane together for like eighteen hours or something makes yeah. you get to know people a bit. It was so funny as well, wasn't it? Because it it took about three days to get to Indonesia, and we were there for two days, and then it took us three days to get back again, wasn't it? And we went to four projects. Yeah. For the, and I always and, remember. And as the man, we went to one school. And the kids just couldn't fathom that a man was showing them cross stitch, yeah. and they just found you hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and I had to be the like annoying, um, serious person going, "Yes, this is all very funny, but we really need to ask you about your projects and tell us a bit more that we can send back." And they were like, "Yeah, yeah, we don't want to talk about what we're doing. We want the yeah. the bald man to show us how to cross stitch." Like, There's a photo of me being about a foot taller than every everyone, other person in the room everyone. as well. Very yeah. good for my and ego. a bit paler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, yes. But no, that was that was mad, and it was definitely one of those times when you just like, I can't really believe that craft has taken me to this place. Yeah. And for these sort of things to happen and stuff. And in Manchester, when we had, like, the whole of the people's his 
People's History Museum, we had their whole cafe wall, which probably like double this length, covered in hand-stitched jigsaw pieces. Yeah, because the idea, the campaign was called I'm a Piece, and the idea was we encouraged people to make jigsaw pieces that had solutions on them. That was it, wasn't it? It was about showing that you can be a piece of the solution, but you also want world leaders to be a piece of the solution. We gave um, hand-stitched messages to our local MPs to say, you be a piece of the solution. So the ones on the walls were the ones that we'd all made. Mm -hmm. So everyone makes one each. So every jigsaw in this big collage, they were all free-flowing, so it wasn't a quilt that you'd hang up. You fitted them to the venues they were in. And we had people who took them to schools and had them along corridors in schools. We had them in cathedrals where they were around pillars. So very unique for different areas. But everyone represented a person from Mm -hmm. across the UK because it was just UK-focused. 2000. And it was... It was just under 2,000. And some people still do it now, which strategically doesn't make sense campaign-wise, but they can fit it into their own And I remember because I was I was living in Milton Keynes at the time, yes, and Sarah had yeah. said part of the deal was that, you know, it's all right for her, Crafty McCrafterson, you know, doing the craft of his own thing. But for the rest of us, it's like, it's right, scary, I've yeah. actually got to engage. And so we did a workshop at Milton Keynes Gallery and got mm-hmm. Mark Lancaster, who was an MP, to come down. And I gave him this piece, and on one side it said, with great power comes great responsibility, which is the best Spider-Man quote ever. I use it all the time. And then on the other side it said something like, the Tories support innovation and growth, but are simultaneously destroying the structures that create (laughs) innovation and growth. What's that all about? And gave it to him. And the thing was, because it's handmade... He like looked at it and he understood that it was a thing that had been made by hand, by cross stitch. He knew what it was, and a tiny, tiny part of his cold heart thought <laughs> slightly. But you see. were gonna put something much stronger, and I had to be like, "Gentleness, <laughs> Jamie. Be nice. Be nice. Even yeah. if you struggle with this man, please." Because there was another. There was the "Don't Blow It" campaign, which was write handkerchiefs for your MPs, and I wrote one that said. I promise we will love you more than the banks will. And then decided not to give that to my MP yeah, because, again, that was a bit blunt. Because I think I was like, not oh, it? <laughs> but it doesn't been, help. And what other, what other ones have you done? Loads of campaigns. Go on, rattle some off. because I've got some So more. some of them, like the hanky one, you mm. use for anyone in position of power. So we've had people embroider the don't blow it on the hanky, but in a positive way. So it's don't blow it, use your power for good. We know you've got a difficult job, not what Jamie said. Mm-hmm. Some people have done it for local businesses to change their ways. We did it with Marks and Spencer's board members to get them to pay the living wage. So some people have done them for senators, some for journalists who have been fueling a lot of hatred and discrimination. So a real mix. And then some are more issue led. So that's whatever issue you care about. We've got the heart on your sleeve, which is with Climate Coalition, where we, ha- we ended up getting people go into a march, a climate march, for the first time that had never been on a march before. That really made me feel like this was a good use of craft and time for people. A real mix. Can you tell the story about the first time you engaged with your local MP using craft leaders? So maybe yeah. talking about it, how you were nice. That yeah, story. that's the whole point. For me, I think, mm-hmm. yes, you can be funny with craft for activism you know you can make funny puns to make you feel better but don't actually make positive impact or you could crochet a voodoo doll of Theresa May and get lots of likes on Instagram but for me I don't think that's very effective and I don't think it's helpful for you or for politics so it's the helpful for the word bit. voodoo but that's an <laughs> So for me, it's all that, because I'm an activist, so everything's the activism comes first and work and craft be useful. And a lot of the projects I come up with are about problem solving rather than just come to send on to me. So the hanky thing was I was contacting my MP because I just moved to a new area and I was doing, you know, what you normally do as an activist is every time I got an email to say, can you sign this petition and send it to your MP, I would. I'd support lots of charities, so I'd get their magazines and they'd have like a tear off postcard to sign and post your MP. And the first contact I got back was from their office staff saying, stop contacting us, this is a waste of your time. It's a waste of our time and it's a waste of charities money. 
And I'd never had that before. And I'd never known anyone that had before. And even working in the charity sector in campaigns that I'd never heard that story before. So I was really annoyed. And I could have replied straight away saying, what the bleep? Um, but luckily I had some hoovering to do. So I got my anger out with the hoovering and was like, how dare she? I don't even know her, she doesn't know me. And then I happened to have a pack of handkerchiefs from an old lady who'd given them to me from church. And I have two hankies, so I never need any new ones. But I was thinking about handkerchiefs and I was thinking about metaphors and blow it, don't blow it. The history of handkerchiefs where judges used to put them over their head before they sentenced people to death as a sign of respect. There's lots of, you know, using it for surrender, lots of stuff. And that it's small and delicate. And I was thinking, my, this was the way my brain works, might be a bit different to yours, mm -hmm. Jamie. I was thinking, like, how do I show my MP that I'm not a clicktivist, I'm not a slacktivist, I genuinely care about these issues, but also everything I was sending her was against what she voted for. So how do I also show her that I might not be fully against her, I don't hate her, like a lot of activists have got a bad name for being aggressive and forcing people to do stuff. So I need to show that I care about these issues, I need to show that I want to talk to her and actually build a relationship with her and listen to her and not just scream down a megaphone. So I thought oh, I could embroider a message on this handkerchief. I got my mum and dad to help me with the words so it was non-violent language and intriguing rather than preachy. It was a timeless message and it literally was like a letter but on a handkerchief. So in my own handwriting, they said don't blow it in the corner but dot dot dots and lowercase so it wasn't angry. And then I hand wrote with a biro, dear my MP's name, um, I know you've got a really difficult job but a really powerful job. Um, and I really want you to do the best job you can. Don't blow it, you know, try and help the most vulnerable people in the world and help our planet be the best it can be. Yours in hope, Sarah, with my surname and my postcode, so she knew I was a constituent. And I asked to meet her, which I knew that they have to say yes as a constituent. And they gave me the very cheeky time of early on a Saturday morning. I was like, what? I'm not a morning person. <laughs> And I literally, I stitched over the message and while I was stitching it, I was thinking about, okay, how do I, I'm nervous to meet her, how do I make sure she doesn't see me as aggressive? How can she see me as a useful constituent that we could work together, where we've got common ground, but also challenge each other in a loving way? So while I was stitching, I was really trying to put myself in her shoes as a new MP, figure out as much as I could about her and her staff, figure out what to say when I met her, and scrumpled it into my pocket and basically went over and was like, hi Jane, I'm the one that's been sending you those emails, I'm new to the area, I really care about the issues and I know you're new in your job so I've made you this gift and I just crumpled it out of my pocket. It's like, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really embarrassed and was very like overly humble in a way but that worked quite well because it meant that it wasn't me going, throwing it in her face, going, how dare you? Like it was, and a lot of, in the book, I talk a lot about humble activism and bringing it like, so you're not trying to take power away, but you're trying to encourage power leaders to do the best job they can. And she did, she immediately looked at the back. So she looked <laughs> bemused, could see that it had taken me hours to stitch because it was a lot of text. It was similar to this one, but hers had, um, little violet flowers on. So it literally was like, these are my workshops I do. So you could see it's quite messy on the back. So then she looked at the back, which made me think, oh, she might be a crafter. <laughs> and she said that she was stitching, she joked that she was cross stitching uh, um, a piece of art for her friend's wedding. And her friend was just about to have her 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so we joked about that. But then I could say, what made you be an MP? found out she used to work for John Lewis, so I talked about how brilliant cooperatives were and how, you know, that's really good as an MP, you should support cooperatives. And and she just opened up more. And again, with that craft, it wasn't, you know, I thought the process might work on that train. And then given my MP this strange gift, I thought, hang on a minute, we never treat MPs, where we, we never give gifts to MPs, as a you know, in the charity sector. We give gifts, which are not gifts, they're props to get you know, photos for the local media. 
So it was one of the many like problem solving things that I thought there's something in this. And then I built on it from learning how that worked. Then for the Marks and Spencers campaign, we made, we bought handkerchiefs from M&S to show that we were customers and not boycotters. <laughs> and we Googled everything about them to have a bespoke, timeless message from them, from someone that we thought they'd admire, whether it was a musician or a business leader. or So from that one campaign, I learned how to improve on it strategically for others. But there was, yeah, there was this magical quality that you mentioned of how, you know, when you, you can sort of stitch your feelings into something. And I, it sounds really hippie, and I haven't put this in the book because I thought it sounded too hippie, but I feel like I'm in a safe space. <laughs> you know, when you, whatever you stitch, I do think that feeling seeps into it. And I think the person that receives it knows. And I've had it before where people have given me stuff that you can see is rushed or that you can see that it's about them and not about the cause, and that's a challenge, is, you know, this isn't about you showing off in your craft. This is about, do you care about an issue? And how we, especially with people you disagree with, you know, my MP at the time, I've got a different one now. I disagreed with her on nearly everything. But while I was making it, I tried not to get those feelings out. My feelings were... I'm presuming she's a nice person what's made her vote in this way and then when I met her she told me that she was campaigning on FGM stuff very quietly before it was even mentioned in the newspapers and I got to help her with some of that stuff which I would never have heard that she was doing that without her quietly telling me she was so I do think if you give something that has got a lot of love and humility in we're all human beings. I think people do sort of hmm. give back what you get, don't you? And I think those objects can be really powerful. One of the things I talk about a lot is like you, you can't be angry in cross stitch. Well, you, you can, can try. Be, you but can, yeah. yeah, but it yeah. fades, doesn't it? Yeah. So I had, like the year before last, I had a really crap year and I was like, right, I'm going to cross stitch the five stages of grief. So wow. denial, anger, uh, negotiation, depression and acceptance and it did deny an anger and I was alright. Yeah. So <laughs> it's almost like you can't and if you want to do like something like a lot of the time people want to do funny things that are a bit snarky, but if you yeah. ever try and make an angry like you can make an angry painting because mm. you can do it in ten minutes, but you can't make an angry cross stitch because at some point you're gonna be so soothed by the process. I don't know, you can like I follow stuff on Instagram where I don't agree with it but you you know, it could be pretty brutal stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's... I still would maintain that that person can't... You can't maintain that level of anger unless you're, mm. like, really... Mm. You know, there's a lot of people that will do things for controversy mm. and yeah. will maintain that throughput as okay, a consequence. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, yeah. how many F-bombs do you need? I've seen yeah. them all. But yeah, yeah. I don't think that you can be, like, really... Like, and that's yeah. the beauty of what, like, I always quote you as saying when you're making a thing if you're being a craftivist you have time to reflect on the issues that you're engaging with in ways that you don't by clicking an email yeah. or forwarding yeah. on an email and stuff yeah like sinking into that subject on so many levels mm -hmm. it makes it quite profound I think. yeah and your memory goes into it so one of the projects i do is you stitch a footprint a message on a footprint for you to keep as a bit of inner activism and the metaphor reminds you that every step you take in life has an impact, whether you like it or not. So try and remember to like smile at the bus driver, put your money where your you know principles are, but also it's a footprint that reminds you of a journey. So what journey are you on? So it's a good little reminder to not be on autopilot. And every time, like I've made mine, and every time I look at it, and it's on my bookshelf before I leave the flat, so I see it every day. Oh, I'm so sorry. And, um, and every time I look at it, it brings me back to how I was feeling and what I was thinking while I was making it, because it is that physical reminder. So even if you make, so some of our projects you make for yourself because it is about being that reminder. Some of it's about giving gifts. Some of it's about the street art that you put out for other people to find. But there's so much investment that's gone in and not just in time and energy, but in thought, in, yeah, there's so much wrapped up in a piece of craft that the more I do it, the more layers you see. Because when you started as well, you would do things 
and leave them places, wouldn't you? Yeah. But you just like you'd stitch a thing and then stick it somewhere and walk away. I always remember. Yeah. And oh, and oh God, what was her name? Mini Bannons. Mom Emma, the what did she call herself? She always used to attach things to things, but she had her own nickname. Do you remember? She she was one of Lauren's friends. Emma, she was part of the your Um, posse. What did she call herself? The something orator, where she'd like attach things. Yeah. That'll come back to me. Yeah. And she, you she'd mean. always use cable ties. Yeah. And so it was almost like she called herself the cable tie-inator. Because she'd like <laughs> crochet a thing and then cable tie it to somewhere. Mm. But that wasn't what she called herself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. But I always like that idea. It's, it's tricky, the, the length of time. The what? The macrominator. Close, but that should be a thing. <laughs> that should Macrame's got to come back, hasn't it? Is it bad? Maybe already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was a challenge as well. Like, so my mini banners that were cross stitched, as much as I wanted to keep them because I spent hours on them, that was also a good challenge for me to go. This isn't about me. This is about the message and trying to provoke people to think about stuff. Mm. And it's about everyone else rather than you. So you know, in terms of our egos, it was a good exercise for me to be like. What's the issue? Where am I going to put it that relates to that issue? What do I want, want people to think about when they see it? So it had nothing to do with me, which was good for my own mental health, good for well-being, better for the cause because it shows it's not about you. It was. It didn't say my name on it. You know, it said a tag of a lonely craftivist or craftivist collective for people to find out more about the issue. But it was a good and also finishing it. Because I'm nervous about everything, like I really am a warrior rather than a warrior. Yeah. Um, I would be like, oh, I've got to put this up now. But because I'd spent hours doing it, you're like, of course I've got to put it up. So it was a good challenge for me to do it. And I, so the graffiti artists, the street artists I know, one of the biggest motivations for most of them is they love the excitement of will they get caught or will they not. Mm. I hate it. So, and me and the photographer I normally bring with me hates it as well. So it's also a good thing to be like, do we really care about this issue enough to go do it? And then take a good picture and share it for people to find. And I think one of the first posts you put of mine was a mini banner. Mm-hmm. Was for people to find stuff out. So again, it was like putting it up was a real challenge for me to be like, is this worth putting it up? Is there a strategy behind it? Is it a good use of resources that could end up in a landfill or you know there's so much stuff in the world am I part of consumerism or is this a good use so there's all these other layers that you know what will a passerby think is it provocative enough but not telling them what to do but not disempowering them by giving them a fact that they just feel like it's so shocking they don't know what to do like it made me that having to slow down and think through all of that strategy made me a much better activist as well as craftivist because then it made me practice in all my activism in jobs and activist groups I was in I was like who are we trying to target how are we doing it in a loving way because I'd learned that through the craft because I'd spend hours crafting and thinking through everything Mm. so I think it yeah helped me be a better activist has for you with cross stitch are there parts of it that have you've transferred into other parts of life and it's made you, like it's helped me be better at slowing down and thinking more. But for you with cross stitch, has it translated into other areas where you've been like, oh, I think cross stitch has influenced the way that I am with my partner. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm covered in floss all the time. <laughs> now I think the one, one, it's definitely changed my life. That's what's weird. I never really Isn't thought it? just going into the shop and going, oh, that'd be funny would would end up with me doing it for a living for a start yeah and just ending up in this position like i'm i feel really blessed to be able to like see loads of amazing needlework and like i worked out not very long ago that like my whole thing is just to change the way people think about needlework but it's that thing of like because i i'm not what people expect as an embroiderer it means that i can dismantle their preconceptions which means then you can talk about how groovy embroidery needlecraft is and it is a really groovy thing to be a part of anyway so it's just like now that with things like social media there's a lot more throughput it's very easy for me to share all this work and bask in people's glory and that's for me to end up as a curator rather than a designer or an artist or something has been a really useful experience as well because I'm not 
comfortable with being an artist and stuff. Like I, I'd much rather be an ambassador. I'd much rather facilitate other people doing things like craft tourism or just getting into needlework in the first place anyway. And that always works really well. And you can see you love curating. Like, I've seen when you've curated artwork exhibitions in knitting and stitch and show and stuff, you can see it on your face that you just love the curating side. Yeah. What's Which bonkers? I hadn't seen you as that when I first met you. I was like, who's an artist that uses craft? But yeah. you're a total curator. Yeah, it's a total relief as well to not be an <laughs> artist. Like, if you're being an artist, that's really hard work because you've got to have meaning and stuff. Whereas I can just go... Look at all these lovely things that I've arranged in a slightly off kilter way, which kind of works and stuff. I never did art at school. I went to school in Wooten, not very far from here. My dad was a German teacher at that school for like 35 years. And the GCSE art teacher always used to remind me how when I was a kid, she bounced me on her knee. And that put me off doing art, just <laughs> wholesale. So I never did an art GCSE. I never did any of those sorts of things. And so I kind of meandered like largely failed at my A-levels, did a psychology degree, sold home insurance, did a whole load of claptrap, find a needle and thread, have a go, and then like really got back into like just seeing loads of art and seeing loads of design and seeing all these things and I think understanding my responses to them and all those sorts of things and that's been really refreshing and like ending up in this position. My wife's sister's godmother is a woman called Rachel Campbell Johnson who's the art critic for the times and my wife's sister got married last year and at the wedding we were chatting because I was like she's the art critic for the times I totally need to get in there and at one point she went do you know Grayson and I went of course I don't because I'm just some guy with a blog who meandered in off the street or whatever but in a way it's really refreshing because I'm not saying my uh, website or anything has a lot of like gravitas but it's got a bit of traction and it's definitely been around I'll long be enough to have some meaning probably more than Grayson's website sorry Grayson I doubt that uh, maybe for a dress mm. but but to meander in and, and like now I understand the context that we're in in terms of needlework and where we're at right now but not having any of that like art history background and not having any of that formal training I can kind of meander in and go I like that I don't like that and I don't care how much it costs, it's just bollocks. And because I've got tattoos and because I don't really care anymore, like it's really freeing to not be so steeped in the sincerity of it all. Like I'm, I just love being able to show people things, you know, a lot of the time like we do not safe for work Saturdays on the website where we show rude things or we'd have stitch chasms and for some people seeing something sexually explicit that's done in, I don't know, uh, needle felting it just makes them realize that's okay and that's the thing that can happen and it might prompt them to have a go and that's what's cool and that's what I've realized is my whole thing Make and it accessible uh, yeah and taking it seriously but not so too seriously because that's the other thing with the whole craft versus art debate is like craft can't be taken seriously it's just craft art must be taken seriously because it's art and it's all just claptrap you know and mm -hmm. so I'm I feel very lucky to be able to just casually meander knowing full well vaguely what I'm doing, mm. but just to be able to just butt around and stuff. And, and then, like, in 2012, yeah, because Facebook told me it was five years ago that we did the thing in Milton Keynes Gallery, I got to do an exhibition at the Knitting and Stitching Show, which runs London, Dublin and Harrogate. And I just got in touch with people who I knew, and we ended up with, like, a car door that had flowers cross-stitched on it, and a tapestry weaving of drugs and guns, and all these things that people had never necessarily seen before. And it was just cool to just like blow out the cobwebs a little mm. bit and just remind people how vibrant this stuff is. And also that it's accessible for everyone. Because mm. I get worried that people think craftivism is just for cra people who like crafts. And actually, I, because my background's in the charity sector, and the charity sector totally laughed at me doing craftivism. And, you know, quite a derogatory, like, oh, what is that? That's not going to work. That's not needed. And now they're all like, can you come and do stuff with us? <laughs> and, not, and not just with the craft audience. I think people are seeing that it's useful for anyone. And especially with young people now where mental health problems are on the increase and we're so used to being online rather than offline. There's a real people seeing craft as a useful tool and not just a hobby that you either like craft or you don't. And I think that's been a shift in the last few years because of places like Mr. X Stitch where you can say, you might think craft's this, but it can also be this. And it can be that, and it can be all these other things. And I talk about my craftivism as 
craft is the tool not the taskmaster so regardless of whether you like craft or not it's accessible to everyone you know I've done hundreds of workshops around the world and touch wood no one's not been able to do it unless they've got a disability everyone has been able to do it even if they've never picked up a needle before which is very different to art where you get a blank canvas and people go can't do it like it's much more accessible Thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, please like the video down below. If you uh, feel like you're interested in what I have to say, please subscribe to my channel. That'll be great. Uh, there'll be another video here for your viewing pleasure of something else that I have to say. And until next time, this is your boy, Mr. X Stitch, signing off. Love ya. Bye.